There are two dilemmas that rattle the human skull. How do you hold on to someone who won't stay? And how do you get rid of someone who won't go? From Pod 617 Productions, it's Shine On, a presentation of Berkman, Botker, Newman, and Shine. Now here's your host, attorney Evan Shine. Episode number 25 of the Shine On podcast, I'm Evan Shine. We kick off today's episode with special guest, writer, Madeline DeLee. She's our leadoff hitter on today's episode, and Madeline's going to join me on today's docket. We're going to talk to Madeline about her terrific recent article for Shondaland, Is It Possible to Get a Relationship Do-Over? Madeline and I are going to talk relationships and tackle the very question that I know keeps producer Dave tossing and turning (laughs) and up at night, and it's a question that's on the minds of so many people out there, how to get a relationship rebooted and how to get out of that feeling of relationship Groundhog Day. Great hustle on your part, Evan, to get the author of the article. So I'm looking forward to that. That's well, a great spot. And Dave, following the docket, we're going to get right into a new study published this year in the journal Child Development. From Arizona State University, the REACH Institute, which stands for Research and Education Advancing Children's Health Institute, there's a new study that has found that children experience a fear of being abandoned when their divorced or separated parents are engaged in conflict. On today's episode, I'm thrilled to be joined by psychologist, professor, researcher, and the author of this new study, Dr. Carrie O'Hara. We're going to talk to Carrie about her study and the key findings. My interview with Carrie O'Hara is coming up on the other side of this week's docket. This is an interview that you're not going to want to miss. All right, Evan, we have a very special edition of the docket today. Are you ready, my friend? Dave, I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's do it. And now, let's see what's on the docket. Well, article here from September 13th of this year from Shondaland.com. And the headline reads, is it possible to get a relationship do-over? There may be hope for reconciling a relationship that seems like it's doomed. The article goes on to say over the last year and a half, relationships have been put through many a test no more so than our romantic bonds. And then it goes on to detail and give examples of relationships that need a so-called do-over. And Evan, would you like to tell our listening audience why this is a special moment? Dave, I got to tell you, how absolutely fantastic is it? We have the writer, Madeline DeLee, with us to talk about the article, All right. with us on the docket segment. And look, you may have seen her work and her articles published in several media outlets, CNN, The Washington Post, Shondaland, Real Simple, Playboy, and many more. Madeline, we're excited. Thanks for joining me on today's docket. Thanks for having me. Madeline, we're going to have some fun. And as producer Dave mentioned, you wrote an article which I absolutely love. Dave mentioned the title, Is It Possible to Get a Relationship Do-Over? And you start out the article by talking about just the test that our relationships have been through for the past 18 months, and specifically our romantic relationships. And I've talked about on prior episodes of the podcast, really the impact of the pandemic on divorce rates and our relationships. So I'm going to turn it over to you because I hear in my practice, the stress, the struggle, but what do you see out there? I I have heard from a lot of my friends that, especially given the close quarters, many of us have been uh, enjoying over the last several months, that that's that's put some strain on a lot of relationships. And I have definitely seen um, an uptick in, I think, people evaluating just just what tenable and what isn't. I remember when the pandemic first hit, and this was like March, April 2020, I had a friend who said, how great is this? I get to spend time with my husband. Now, fast forward, two weeks turned into two months, two months Mm -hmm. turned into a year. And now we are 18, 19 months, and they're now divorced. So, oh. and, and, I, and I think as you talk about in the article, you mentioned five or six of your friends, they recently announced that they called it quits and they ended their relationships or their marriages. When you learned this about the people that, did it surprise you? Sometimes my husband and I, a, a long time ago, reached the conclusion that you can never know what a relationship is like. I think 
this time has made that exceptionally clear that you just can't know what it's like to be in a relationship if you're not the one in the relationship. It's true. And I always say, look, this time, people haven't spent this much time together since their honeymoon. And again, at first it was, this is nice. We get to reconnect. We get to watch TV, spend time together. But now it's like, how many more Netflix shows can we watch together? (laughs) Nine o'clock at night, you've already spent 10 hours with your husband, wife, partner, significant other. And there's not for some people that much to talk about. And so I think it's causing a lot of stress on relationships and a lot of anxiety. For the couples that you know, that where the breakups occurred during the pandemic, do you think that the pandemic caused these breakups or do you think that there were cracks in the relationship that the pandemic put a bigger light on? That's a good question. I think it's probably the latter. While the conditions have been stressful for everyone, a solid relationship is a solid relationship. These conditions have exacerbated what might have been the cracks in the foundation and maybe amplified, but I I don't know about creating. And then let's talk about some of those cracks. And in the article, you mentioned a newly released novel, The Rehearsal by author Annette Christie. And you talk about this endless loop that the characters are stuck in before their wedding day. And while it's a novel, the truth is for many people, this is real life. People, (laughs) you use the phrase Groundhog Day, and this is reality not fiction. And so tell us your thoughts on the cycle that people have been in. I think you refer to it in the article as the cycle of struggle. In the novel, these the characters are trapped in the day before their wedding. They decide to call it off and then they have to keep reliving the day before their wedding before they get it right and work through what it is that's holding them back as a couple. The healthy relationship has the flex to do that, to examine and um, adjust as needed. And an unhealthy one is more brittle and is likelier to break. So let's talk about both of those situations, the not so great relationship, the unhealthy relationship, and the one that requires work. You talk about these three different doors, door one, the relationship that leads to a breakup, door two, this groundhog cycle, the cycle of struggle, It just keeps going on and on and on. And then there's this door number three, which is absolutely fascinating to me, which is a relationship do-over. And I know there's people who are listening to this episode and they're thinking to themselves, relationship do-over, is that even possible? Can it be done? How does it happen? There isn't a do-over button. You can't just start again. But I, I talked with Dr. Jen Mann as part of my research for this. And she talked about the commitment that's really involved in doing the work for both parties, that that both people have to be willing to really, to do that reflecting, looking inward, to set aside blame, acknowledge their own role and responsibility in whatever shortcomings have surfaced. And that's a lot of work. It's not easy. It's not easy. It is a lot of work. And you mentioned Dr. Jim Mann, who you spoke with for the article. She's a marital and family therapist. She hosts the VH1 show, Couples Therapy, and she's the author of The Relationship Fix. Do you think people, before they get married, realize just how much work marriage takes? No. (laughs) I feel like there should be a class or a boot camp or something that everybody thinks it's going to be this honeymoon period. And as I was thinking about it and reading your fantastic article, I was thinking to myself, imagine getting married right before the pandemic and then the pandemic hits. And this is how you're spending your honeymoon the first year of your marriage. And look, this hasn't been easy for anybody with children, without children, kids are home learning virtually, everybody's concerned about health issues, medical issues, but imagine just getting married, you have this idea in your mind, what your marriage is going to look like, and then bam, the pandemic hits, and now you're stuck home with your spouse, no honeymoon, your honeymoon's on your couch, instead of the Caribbean islands. Right. 
Right. Yeah, it's, I, I'm sure that that was a significant eye opener for <laughs> some, for some newlyweds. Definitely. You have the, those fake bellies that they give kids so that they know what pregnancy is going to be like, but I don't think that there is an equivalent. For no. <laughs> <laughs> There's not. And I think there should be. Let me ask you, cause you mentioned the work, the relationship reboot that you talk about in the article. And if I'm speaking with Dr. Mann, what's your advice on how to bring up this conversation to your partner, to your spouse, significant other, that you're in this cycle of struggle and your relationship needs work and it needs that fix and it needs that, that reboot? Oh, that, that's a good question. The likelihood that someone is going to feel culpable or that a finger is being pointed at them and that you're being held responsible for the other person's frustrations or even unhappiness, I think that likelihood is very high. So, and as someone who has gone through a great deal of therapy herself, you know, I think that approaching it from an I feel position is, is probably your, your best bet. We can only control ourselves. We can't control our partners. And so I, I think coming to that from here's where I am and where are you and, and leaving space for your partner to, to respond and, and react, even if that is initially with hurt or anger. If it has to be work that's done together, then that conversation has to be one that, that both people are willing to have. And you just hit something at the end, which I want to ask you about because I think it's incredibly powerful. It requires work. And because therapy, couples counseling, because it's a voluntary process, it's Mm -hmm. one that both people have to commit themselves to. And if one person doesn't want to go through the work or put in the time or put in the commitment, I would think that the chances of having this relationship reboot, it's not going to work. No. And and I don't think it can if if both parties aren't equally invested. The the two women I interviewed for the article, Pearl was the woman who did end up getting divorced. She's in the process of divorcing now. She said she knew when her husband wasn't listening to her. They went through the motions of going to therapy, but he wasn't able to apply what they were doing in therapy to anything outside of the therapist's office. And, you know, that was when she knew that she needed a divorce. This was absolutely fantastic. Your article, your work. Tell us where more people could find out about this article and all your other articles. So this ran on Shondaland.com, but you can also follow me on Twitter at at MMDelee. That's my handle. This was tremendous. Thank you for coming on the Shonda Podcast. Thanks so much. Our featured guest this week on the Shonda Podcast is Dr. Carrie O'Hara. Carrie is an assistant research professor in the psychology department at Arizona State University. She is a psychologist and the author of an important new study in the journal Child Development that focuses on the relationship and impact between parental conflict and children's mental health. Her research and work focuses on childhood development and the best methods to help children adjust after stressful times in their lives. Carrie, I appreciate the time. Thank you for joining us. How are you? Thank you, Evan. I'm really excited to be here. Carrie, I want to talk about your work and in, in your research, and which focuses on risk and protective factors that predict how children adjust after stressful events. And one of those events is divorce. And that's one of the most stressful events on families, on parents, and children. And it's one of the aspects of the divorce process that I feel does not get enough attention, the impact of this life-altering event on the child's mental health in the short term and long term. But before we get into the topic of divorce and your new and incredibly important study released this year in the journal Child Development, I want to start with another stressful event, and that's the pandemic. And Mm -hmm. when we talk about stressful events, we can now officially add COVID-19 to divorce and death. What have you seen already, and what do you expect to see in the short term and long term when it comes to the impact of the pandemic on a child's mental health? Yeah, I think that's such a really good question. The fir- my first reaction to that is that 
it, it's when children are going through stressful life experiences, one of the reasons why it's so stressful and so impactful on their mental health problems is because usually it comes with a, a whole bunch of changes and a whole bunch of stressors to, on top of whatever event happened to them. So if we think about the pandemic and that sort of contextual point of view, it's made everything more stressful, right? It's another huge stressor that's turned people's lives upside down that makes these other existing stressful life events for children even harder. So in terms of divorce, I've I, I work with a lot of family court judges and, and lawyers that work directly with children. And one of the things that I've been hearing a lot over the last year and a half is that the pandemic has created whole new problems for divorced families and separated and divorced families. My area of expertise is really about conflict that happens in the context of separation and divorce. And the pandemic has introduced all sorts of new things to argue about, to stress about, to try to, to important decisions to make for children. So I don't know, even know if we can quantify what the impact is yet, but we certainly have lots of work to do to understand exactly how it's exerting these negative effects and all the different nuanced ways. I'm sure most of us have heard in the news that just the in overall increase in the prevalence of mental health problems. So it's just a lot piled on top of one, one another. And another area of my work is in um, children who experience the bereavement of a parent. And we know there's there was a new study that came out just a few weeks ago with, with a new number of how many children have been bereaved, have lost a parent due to COVID-19. So like I said, I think it's something that we really need to keep track of and understand how to, how to understand these multiple stressors on a child. And then obviously my big goal is to how can we help? How can we intervene? How can we um, intervene at a time when things are really stressful to sort of change the trajectory that the child might otherwise go on to develop in terms of mental health problems or other kinds of adjustment problems in the absence of any intervention? One of the things that I've seen is when you look at divorce and you look at the pandemic, you look at the limbo that people's lives yeah. have been in. I'm in New York, and but, but it's not just unique to New York. It's all over the country. The court system was shut down for a period of time. Families were in limbo. Children were being educated in a virtual world. Parents were working from home. Kids were not interacting with other children. Kids were home from school. And everybody, their family, was in a state of limbo. Then you add in the layer of divorce and separation and the anxiety and the stresses that you talk about. And everything was just amplified. So I think you make a really good point that we haven't even seen what this will really look like in terms of the impact on mental health and children at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I think the I think the fallout from this is not is not yet known. And I don't I don't know when we'll know for sure. Maybe it'll be several years, but but we certainly need to keep our pulse on it for sure. So Carrie, let's transition and talk about one of your areas of focus and you mentioned which is parental conflict and divorce. And to do that, let's talk about your published study, which came out in the journal Child Development in January 2021. To start, what was the goal of the study and why is this area of research particularly important to you? Yeah, great question. So um, the goal of this study, really, uh, bird's eye view, is to understand more about why conflict that happens between parents after separation and divorce has this deleterious effect on children's mental health. We've known for decades, interparental conflict is stressful for kids. In fact, it's not just divorced families, right? Interparental conflict is stressful for kids in every type of family. It is associated with higher rates of mental health problems, adjustment problems more broadly, regardless of the family type, whether parents are living together, cohabitating, whether they are married, divorced, separated, all, all in between. So that's not new. I also just want to back up a little bit in terms of why this is important. One of the things, and you started to mention this when, when you first introduced um, our conversation, which is about broadly the impact of divorce on children, right? This is a question that we've been grappling with for decades in the, and, and people often ask me, well, what is the impact of divorce on children? And, or does, or more, more pointedly, does divorce hurt children? 
And my answer to that is not necessary. I think that it's much more nuanced than that. And in the mid 80s, there was research that was published that really kind of raised this alarmist view of the impact of divorce on children. That research concluded that children who experience divorce suffer a lifetime of problems, particularly in their own personal relationships. There were a lot of problems with that research that we can go into if you're interested. But, you know, the point is, is that the magnitude that was sort of portrayed, the magnitude of the effect that was portrayed in that research was, was, I would say was magnified. It's not, it certainly aligns with the research that we've had for the last, basically since that time, which shows that yes, on average, children who experience divorce are at increased risk for mental health problems and related problems. It really spans their whole life, educational problems, problems with peers, mental health problems. It also, we know, can go on for a long time. It can follow them into adulthood. We know, you know, they're at risk of difficulties in their own relationships, et cetera, et cetera. But another fact that is kind of the research that has grown and become more rigorous over time is that the vast majority of children do not go on to develop severe long-term mental health problems. In fact, most kids are pretty resilient, depends on how you define that, of course. And even some kids do better, particularly if the, the marriage that was dissolved was particularly turbulent. It's really that subset of kids who suffer really long-term consequences. And it's not a, it's not a insignificant amount of kids. The best research that we have shows that on average, maybe about a quarter of kids who experience divorce are going to go on to develop mental health problems compared to, of course, that happens with children in, who grow up with continuously married families as parents as well, compared to about 10%. So there is, so there's this quantifiable increased risk. But the question is, how do we know which children are going to fare well and, and aren't going to go on, you know, to have problems under what conditions is divorce harmful or benign with respect to their long-term development? And, and time and time again, one of the one of the most, the I would say the most well-documented risk factor for children not doing well after divorce is conflict. As parents continuing to engage in different forms of conflict over time. And so that's what really drove this study. Prior to, prior to the study, we talked a lot about, okay, we know divorce increases risk and we know that actually it's the children that are exposed to high conflict divorce that are the ones that are at most risk. But my question is, okay, if we're going to do something about that, if we're going to try to help children deal with, cope with, and, and become resilient in the face of conflict after divorce, we need to know what links the two. Why does con confer risk for mental health problems in children? So that was really the point of this study is to really understand what lies in the middle. We know that conflict is related to, you know, an increased mental health problems, but why? What's happening in between? So that was, that was really what, uh, what uh, spurred the study to begin with. And Carrie, I love that in your desire and your goal of figuring out the link and how to cope and how for children to deal with the conflict and deal with the stresses. Because look, the reality is, I would imagine if you ask parents, do they know that conflict's harmful for children? The majority of them are going to say yes. And, but the question, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper than that, because despite parents knowing that conflict is harmful for children, time and time again, we see parents arguing in front of children or putting children directly in the middle of a divorce or separation. So what fascinates me about the research, and we're going to get into it because you bring up so many great points about family structure and the different dynamics, but what is it about the conflict and what happens in the short term or long term that I find to be absolutely fascinating? And so Carrie, I want to ask you, as part of your study, you interviewed children, and I believe the number that I saw was around 559 children. Why was interviewing children in the different age range, ages 9 to 18, so incredibly important for the research? Yeah, that's a great question. So we, yes, you're right. The sample that uh, this research was, was conducted on was a group of 559 children, 9 to 18. Their parents had been divorced or, or separated in the last two years or less. So they were pretty close to the divorce process. And the reason that it was important to get that age range, this is always a question that comes up. More broadly, I would say, with regard to the impact of divorce more generally on children, is it harder for teens? Is it harder for young kids? The question that I have come to reading the literature um, is that 
it's hard for kids <laughs> of all ages. It's probably uh, hard in different ways, depending, depending on what's developmentally salient at the time. Um, so that, that is, I think, a, if you look at the literature, you'll see some differences here, older kids, younger kids, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at it as a whole, you see that it sort of, it depends. It depends on the sample. It depends on the way that people are measuring things, et cetera. So in this study, um, because we had this nice range of kids, and, and by the way, we, the reason that we don't have kids younger than nine is because we really wanted to know their perspective on the conflict. Oftentimes researchers, for lots of reasons, ask parents about conflict, right? I mean, you just brought up a really good point about how parents might perceive it differently. I mean, I've had families that I've worked with clinically that will say, we don't fight in front of the kids. We yell at each other when the doors close. Well, <laughs> the kids can hear you and the kids are, or they can feel it, right? So there's reasons why, so we were really interested in the child's perspective and we wanted their report on conflict. So that was the reason why we didn't go younger than nine. We also had a question about whether the conflict impacted children differently in different age groups. And we did do that analysis because we had a large enough sample, we could do that. Um, we did not find conflict was related to what we'll probably get to in a moment, which was fear of abandonment. That was the main intermedi uh, intermediary variable that we focused on. We did not find that there were any differences in that relation, but we did find that younger children were more likely to, to report fear of abandonment. So I think it's important to understand especially if we think about intervention, which is always my end goal. <laughs> I, I love doing the research. I am um, a scientist at heart, but, but really I only care about things if they're applicable, if they're going to actually help people in the real world. And so I think it's important for us to be studying these processes in diverse groups of children so that we can understand, okay, if we find a difference, that might mean something for intervention. Let's say that for younger kids, fear of abandonment is the real issue, but for older kids, maybe it's fears about their own relationships, for example, maybe teens or young adults. I don't have any evidence to back that up, but just as an example, if we find that there are different processes that are linking the experience of conflict and mental health problems, then we need to do something different to help those kids right? To have real implications for how we help. Carrie, you mentioned hearing the perspective of the children, which may often be different than the perspective of the parents, and you touch on the feeling of abandonment. So let's transition yeah. to that, which is such an important point in your study. And I read that the feeling of abandonment by children and the link to future mental health problems, it was something that stood out in the research, especially for those children who had strong relationships with their fathers. Why is that? And did that surprise you in the course of the research? Yeah, it did surprise me, actually. I, so our hypothesis for this study was, well, let me back up for just a moment. We had two questions. One was, does fear of abandonment explain the relation between conflict and mental health problems? And then we had another question, which was, does a high quality parent-child relationship actually mitigate that risk pathway, as we say it? So the pathway from exposure to conflict and feeling that fear of abandonment doesn't matter whether or not uh, you have a high, high quality relationship. And the reason that we did this is because uh, a high quality relationship with your parent is one of the most protective, one of the strongest protective factors for children across the board, but especially for children who experience separation and divorce. And so we thought, okay, well, if there's anything that can help sort of mitigate that pathway, maybe it's relationships between parents. Maybe a child who has a really strong relationship with their parent is less likely to feel fear of abandonment in the face of conflict, right? So that was our hypothesis. We were wrong. <laughs> um, and I, gotta tell you, I was wrong too, because I would have thought that answer would have been yes too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really thought that that was based on the prior literature was really mixed, which was why I was so interested in, in addressing it in this sample in particular. But so, but what we found instead was that we, we did not observe that protective effect of a, of a really good relationship between parents and children. And so then we thought, okay, well, let's look at it. Does it matter if it's the mother-child relationship or a father-child relationship? It's one of the, one of the benefits of the sample that we were using is that we had, a, we had a large group of kids and we had about, oh, I think it was 30 to 40% of them were reporting on their relationship with their father. So that's great because in most studies, we don't hear enough, but we don't, we don't have enough information about dads, which is a, a limitation typically. So anyways, we looked at this relationship. So we thought, okay, well, 
what about if is it the father-child relationship or a mother-child relationship that might have a different effect? And we found that for children who had reported on their relationship with their mother, it didn't matter. Conflict was related to fear of abandonment across all, all levels of, of a high quality relationship. For dads, the story was different. What we found was that for children who actually had low and moderate quality of relationship with dad, there was no relation between fear of uh, conflict and fear of abandonment. But it was the kids who reported a really good relationship with dad that had that similar pattern that we saw with the, with the kids that were reporting on mom. So they, when, when children had this really good relationship with dad and they were exposed to high levels of conflict, they had higher fears of abandonment. Luckily, that was a small part of our sample. I think it was only about 5% that fell in that uh, region where they had this, you know, really great relationship with dad, but also exposed to really high levels of conflict and then in turn, higher levels of fear of abandonment. And so that was really interesting. And, and it's sort of a for better or for worse kind of finding because the kids who had really good relationships with dad and were in a family where there was low levels of conflict, they had the lowest fears of, levels of fear of abandonment. So they really benefited from that relationship with dad under certain circumstances. But on the other hand, it was an, an extra risk factor under other circumstances. So that's fascinating to me, the differences between mothers and fathers and how kids perceive and, and have that fear of abandonment. What did the study and the research suggest about children and their fear of abandonment, depending on their family dynamic for children who were part of families where the parents were in the process of divorcing mm. versus the fear of abandonment if their parents were already separated and divorced? Yeah, that is an excellent question. I am not aware of any uh, sample that can answer that question yet, but that's certainly something that one of the questions that I have that I'm going to be pursuing in future research is, is related to that, which is what is it, what does the course look like? In one of my prior studies, I looked at trajectories of conflict. Probably most of us who work in the family law community have heard this general effect that conflict goes down over time, right? Conflict reduces as a function of time for most families. And that's, that's true. That bears out in the research for sure. You, you think about the nature of separation and divorce. I mean, look, people are getting divorced for really good reasons, right? But typically there's some conflict around separation sure. and divorce. That's pretty normal. And so it's so one of the questions is, is it that, is it that flipping conflict that happens around separation of divorce that, that hurts kids? Or is it the chronic conflict that really, I'm sure you've worked with the families that just, it's been years and and there's just still so embroiled in this conflict. Is that what it is? So, so I'm really interested in trying to track those trajectories. And I think we could answer your question if we had some information, so if we had data on that. Well, one of the issues is tracking families. So typically how the research is done is that we go to court files and we find families who have recently filed for divorce or have in the last couple of years. And so the, so the question would be, how would you best design a, a big, a not, large enough study to answer that question um, while also catching people kind of before it happens. There, there are a few studies that, that did follow families, but none that I am aware of that have answered that question in particular. And Carrie, you mentioned this before, and I absolutely love what you said, which is when you have research and a study of this magnitude and this importance, it's then the intervention, it's the steps, yeah. it, it's getting this research and the study out there to parents, to yes. families, to different people, and really finding a way to understand the conflict, understand what children are going through, how to predict it, how to intervene, and how to handle it in an appropriate way. So for everybody listening, what do parents need to know about the way conflict in a family truly affects children, and how as parents could you handle certain things in a different way, even if you're going through the difficult journey and path of divorce to shield your children from the conflict, knowing that there really is an impact on the relationship between conflict and mental health problems that may result. I love that question. <laughs> it's my favorite question to answer, um, which is that there's lots of things parents can do. Parents have so much power in this, in this situation. I, I would say that the power of parenting is probably one of the most robust findings in all of developmental and clinical psychology. 
child clinical psychology. And it does not, it, it, it is certainly true in this area as well. I always say that it's not divorce that hurts kids. It's the way divorce happens that can hurt kids, right? It's also the way that parents can carry out a divorce that can protect their children. There's so much that they can do. So a couple of things. Um, again, that's the most important takeaway is that parents can feel empowered that they can protect their children. And by the way, even if their ex-spouse or ex-partner doesn't feel the same way, parents can on their own make a big, make a big difference. One parent. In fact, there was one study, I think it published in about 2013, that showed that this, what we call the compensation effect, where when one parent provided really good quality parenting, this was in the context of high conflict divorce, um, when the other parent was not providing good good parenting, that, that first parent could really have this compensation effect um, and protect children. Yeah. yeah. So really important for parents to know, because sometimes parents will say, well, how am it takes two to fight? How am I going to, how am I going to do this? And, and that's true. And it does, and it is really hard. And I also don't mean to minimize it. Like I said, getting divorced is difficult. People get divorced for a lot of good reasons. People have really important decisions to make. And so it makes sense that there's arguments that come up and there are things that parents can do to protect their children. I actually love the word that you used, which is to shield the parent, shield the children from the conflict. That's one thing that we talk about in our interventions. We uh, invite parents to sort of picture this protective shield in their mind when they're uh, up against a situation that where their children might be exposed to and make, making sure that they remind themselves to sort of put up that protective shield uh, whenever they're around that other parent and it might, might lead to conflict. I think it's also really important to talk about the different types of conflict. Oftentimes we're thinking about what we call overt types of conflict where parents are yelling and calling each other names and screaming at each other and throwing things, et cetera. And that is certainly stressful and, and, and harmful for children. But the less frequently talked about types of conflict are also hard for kids, The what we call covert in the research. So that would be putting children in the middle. That would be bad mouthing the other parent. Those types of types of conflict are really hard for kids. And so I would say that parents need to be really careful not to say things that make their children feel caught in the middle or like they have to pick sides. Obviously, that can include saying really mean things about the other parent, like your dad is terrible or your mom never follows through on anything of those sorts of direct attacks. But it's also tricky because it's not always so obvious. There are some ways it could be like asking your child to pass messages asking them to be a messenger or a spy who was at dad's house that this weekend etc um, and, and Terry, or, I've, had, I've had those cases that specifically that i was going to mention the, the messenger putting the child in the middle yeah. because the conflict when parents are living together the child will see the conflict because the parents are living together in one house under one roof and for yeah. many people once parents separate which is something that a lot of judges, a lot of people encourage because then the children are not part of that conflict and they don't have to see it between their parents on a day in, day out basis. But then you have the conflict that you mentioned, which I think is so incredibly important and it's important to talk about, which is when the child's put in the middle or the child's a messenger. And I've had those cases in the emotional and psychological manipulation of a child in particular. And I'm thinking of the case I had recently it, 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 it's so real and it's incredibly important and it doesn't get enough attention because it's a different type of conflict as you described. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we need to be talking about it a lot more and we need to be educating parents about what, what that looks like because some parents, they don't mean to, like you say, I think most parents, you ask them, is conflict bad for kids? They're going to say, yes, they know that, but they don't necessarily, especially we're in the, when they're in the throes of this really emotionally charged situation and conversations, they don't, necessarily know that the way that they're saying things it can be more subtle and and that can be it can be something as simple as what did you have for dinner oh you know tacos again pizza again that kind of thing sure. just just all little comments that makes kids or asking kids lots of questions i have kids that say oh, when i come home from mom's house dad's got a whole list of questions for me about what i ate and what i wore and who i talked to i mean it's it, and and children can will describe feeling like if they say the wrong thing, it might lead to more conflict or, or sometimes it just makes them feel bad. I mean, I think the bad mouthing, particularly even in subtle ways, but I mean, if you think about it from a child's perspective, if someone's saying their parent is bad, a lot of kids, particularly young kids will say, okay, well, if dad's bad, then I must be bad too. I'm sure. part of him. Right. And so I think parents don't necessarily 
don't necessarily notice that. And they also, I think parents' emotional experience is sometimes ignored in this, in this context. And parents have really strong, valid emotions when they're, when they're divorcing. And so I think treat, teaching parents how to notice those emotions and, and deal with them in ways that don't put their kids in the middle is, is hard, but critical. Is there a way, Carrie, for parents to talk to their child or children about whether it's the conflict or what's happening in a way that it encourages a child to feel that it's a safe space to feel that they can communicate his or her feelings? Yeah, I think that's a great, great question. I think that parents are often sometimes worried that they're going to say the wrong thing or they try to keep a straight face and it's like, uh, zero or none, right? Or, or, or one or a zero where they're sure. like, oh, well, I can't ever say anything about the divorce or I have to tell my kid everything. And I think there's a middle ground in there where parents can talk to kids. And I mean, look, even after, let's say that there, a conflict does happen and because that's, it's going to happen, right? Sure. These are, these are human beings <laughs> going through a difficult time. It's going to happen. Instead of ignoring it, what a parent might decide to say is to, to, tell their children, I'm sorry that you had to hear that. I got really upset and I said things that I didn't mean. And you don't have to worry because this is a, this is an adult problem and, and your other parent and I are going to figure it. And we both love you. Even if we, even if we're having a hard time getting along with each other, we will always love you and be there for you. So you can say things like that. Apologize, tell kids, I'm sorry. I, I, I got really angry and I said something I didn't mean. You're modeling good emotion regulation and apologizing when you do something wrong. I mean, some things, good things can come out of that. But some parents are just so, they don't know what to say that they just kind of pretend like it didn't happen. And then what happens is kids are left to their own to come up with reasons about why it happens and what it meant and et cetera. And, I, and I've seen at the beginning of divorces and whether it's the negotiation or the litigation, things from the beginning that I have people, clients say to me, Evan, I wish I can go back in time and change how I behaved, change the message. I wish I could have been on the same page as my ex-wife or ex-husband, no matter how difficult it would have been. And that starts from the message, right? That you tell your child in terms of the separation, presenting a unified front. And sometimes yeah. the reality is that's not always possible, but like you mentioned, it can fall on one parent and there still is an effective way yeah. to do that. What are the signs that parents should look for in their children mm -hmm as indicators that their child needs a different approach or their child is in the middle of the conflict? What, what are things that parents could look for in their children? Yeah, uh, I, think, I think warning signs more broadly of children really struggling. So this would apply in the, in the context of conflict for sure, but also, but also more broadly, children who are having a more difficult time concentrating at school. Sometimes kids are worrying about home when they're at school or when they're in class. Sometimes kids are more clingy. They just don't want to be away from you. They're kind of, maybe it's not, they're six or seven years old, but they're hanging on to your legs, so right. to speak. They're more clingy. There's this change. Sometimes kids, sometimes people ask me, well, is divorce a risk factor for depression or anxiety or behavior problems? And I say, yes. <laughs> and all of those things. The kids are the kids deal with these things different and it shows up differently. So I think just paying attention, talking to your children, listening, asking them about how they're feeling, giving them the space, like you said before, I think a safe space to talk about their feelings. So that way you're noticing when things are starting to shift. So your child and if things start to be different and it's a good time to check in. There's also lots of resources, general mental health resources, but I would love to tell you about some of the resources that I know about with regard to divorce, helping children cope with divorce specifically too. So I would say, pay attention, ask questions, listen, and, and, and act. But don't just say, oh, they'll be okay kind of thing. And there are things you, you can certainly do. And also I, part of my work, a lot of my work is in the world of prevention. We're trying to prevent these problems. There's a lot of things that parents can do to even prevent the issue to begin with. So that's, that's critical too. And Carrie, I love that. The prevention, the education. Now, I want to get to that in a second. I want to go back to, you mentioned depression, anxiety. What are the mental health problems that you see result from the conflict between parents? And is there a timing in your research or mm -hmm. study that you saw these mental health 
concerns or issues develop in children? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And I wish that we had a better answer for that. I think that it's just, there's so much variability in how children respond to how people respond to to stress. I mean, bringing us back to the beginning of our conversation, you can look at the pandemic. Some people were really struggling right away. You might have people in your life that you saw this and they were really struggling right away. Other people did fine for many months. And now a year and a half into this, they're really struggling. So I think it's it's really hard to make any generalizations about that. But the, the other thing, one thing I, I forgot to mention about conflict in particular, when children are getting involved in the conflict, that's a warning sign. So if a child, so if let's say that you're on the phone arguing with your ex and your child is all of a sudden like doing whatever they can to get you off the phone or grabbing the phone away or telling you to stop fighting, when children start getting involved, that's that's a that's a really important sign. Or if they're hiding or if they're those sorts of things, it's it's you can think of it as a stress response. Thinking about hearing parents fight and argue is stressful and it's scary. And so if you see those sorts of behaviors in your children, that, that would be a good sign to, to check in. Not that they're automatically going to be sure. developing mental health problems for sure, but a good sign to check in. And, and Carrie, you mentioned the education and so much of your work focuses on the intervention and really preventing, right, yeah. a lot of what we're talking about. And I, I, I've said it before in, in the opening, your study, your research, it, it should be a must for all parents to read, going through a divorce and separation. I think the information is so incredibly important. And again, parents know the conflict's there, but it's coping, it's the intervention. It's what can you do at the forefront to really not even have your child go through this process and experience the conflict in the way that they are. I'm involved in the court system. And when parents are arguing over parenting or custody or visitation, courts will often appoint forensic psychologists to do a mental health evaluation. Judges make determinations. Attorneys advocate for their clients and they make arguments from a court system standpoint. And I know you're intimately involved in the family law community. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest or what would you want different people to know about conflict and really how it impacts children in the community when, when, when these people are making recommendations and decisions that ultimately affect families and children? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, like I said, is that we can intervene effectively. We have ways that we can help support parents through this process to in turn support their children. So I think about it as a two-pronged process. First of all, we need to intervene with parents. Like I mentioned about this study, we thought that high quality parent-child relationships was going to protect kids against conflict and it did not. And so that means that even though those high quality relationships are really important, we need to stop the conflict. We really need to find ways to effectively reduce conflict. And I think that what you said before about parents know this, it's not enough to know it. Most of our programs that are currently implemented in the courts are educational based. Parents have to go for two or four hours and listen to someone lecture them about the risks associated with their behaviors. That works for some people, sure. That doesn't work for most people. Most people, behavior change is hard. That's that's our whole business as psychologists. <laughs> that's a, that's an understatement, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all know this. If any of us have tried to change behavior, and then you throw stress and high emotions, I mean, it's hard. And it makes yeah. sense that it's hard to to stop fighting. It's not something that we tell parents about or shame them into doing it. It's not going to work like that. Um, we need good evidence-based ways of helping child, help, helping parents make those behavior changes. And so one of my goals in my work is to really work on getting evidence-based parenting programs implemented in the court, widely accessible to parents, um, because they can make such a difference. We know this um, from decades of science. We have, so, so one thing, one thing that, that parents can can do is I my colleagues at uh, Arizona State University have been developing a program called the New Beginnings Program and it's been studied for the last 30 years. It's really good evidence in four randomized clinical trials which is the highest gold standard um, scientific method of understanding effects of of an intervention that show that it protects children up to 15 years after participating. And we they're actually turning that into, it used to be a, a, well, it is still is offered in group format, but they're actually turning that into a 
online program that parents can just take on their own. It's 10 modules, 30 minutes each. But what it does, and this is, I, I highlight the New Beginnings program because I'm most familiar with it, but there are a few other, my colleagues and I actually just, we just did a full search of the literature to find what are, what is the evidence for parent education on conflict, on parent parenting quality, on children's mental health. And what we found in common, the, the, the programs that work are the ones that teach parents skills. They teach them things that they can actually do in their everyday life, practical tools to change these behaviors. And so that's my goal. That's one of my big goals is to just get that widely accessible and implemented because it works. We know it works. We have good evidence that it works. And it doesn't make sense, especially, you know, I mean, you know this very well, but these families, they they are going through so much, there's so much money involved and time involved and getting divorced. We don't have to, we don't want to waste their time or resources on things that we don't know if they were. So um, that's one of my goals for sure. And Carrie, that, that's such a great point. And you mentioned the, the tools, the skills, the strategies, and you mentioned it being widely accessible. And I love that because it really should be, because the more people could have this information and have the benefit of the research, the studies, the better it's going to be in terms of the education and getting the message out there. And Kerry, you mentioned Arizona State and your work and your colleagues' work. Tell us about the REACH Institute and really the mission and the goal of your involvement. Yeah, yeah. So our 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 goal at the REACH Institute is to get evidence-based programs, is to really fill that gap or connect that gap or close the gap, I should say, between what's happening in the in the scientific laboratories and what's happening in the community to really join forces. That's why, like I said, my I'm so passionate and committed to working with the family law community, just embedding myself in that community because I couldn't, I can't do this work alone. It, it won't be nearly as meaningful um, or possible, really. And so I think it's really important for researchers and professionals people working in the community with these families to come together to partner. And that's really the main uh, main mission mission of reach is to is to do to do that to sort of get science into real world settings if you will i think that and we do that in lots of different ways as i mentioned parenting is the biggest thing i i think if we can if we can get if we can work with parents in a way that that works well and it doesn't upend their life in terms of being years in therapy kind of thing we should do that the other thing that i'm working on in particular i have a grant supported by the national institute of mental health to develop a program for children to help them cope with the with conflict after separation and divorce and so I'm in the middle of that um, now so I'm excited to be sharing that in the coming years as it develops but we are we're really interested in protecting children from sort of all angles working with parents for sure getting it making sure that these programs are accessible but also supporting children who whose parents may not be able to or willing to participate in those programs and what can we have for them as well. Carrie, you're doing such incredible work in, in, in your research and study and everything that you're doing. We're looking forward to continuing that conversation. And again, you're really doing such incredible work. And you're right, it takes a team of people and partnerships and a community to help advance the mission. Where can people learn more about your research and work and find out about all the articles and everything that you're doing? I have a website that I maintain through Arizona State. I can give you that link. I also you can follow me on Twitter. I post a synopsis of my new studies on my, on my blog, on my website, but also on Twitter. So those are the best ways to reach me. And I just really appreciate you doing the work that you do. I mean, like I said, I truly believe we're in this together. All of us that care about uh, families and, and children in particular going through these, these stressful times. Harry, thank you very much for coming on the Shining Podcast. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. What a show. Episode number 25 in the books. Two great interviews, two absolutely phenomenal guests. Madeline DeLee joining me on this week's docket. Wow. Just absolutely tremendous stuff. And Dr. Carrie O'Hara, great takes, brilliant thoughts and perspectives on the incredibly important topic of children and mental health and the impact of parental conflict. Keep sending in your emails and comments to you, Evan, at shineanddivorce.com. You can find this episode and the complete archive of episodes along with my blog post featuring our guests on my website, shineanddivorce.com. To all the Shine and Podcast loyal listeners, thank you. To my guy, 
producer David Yaz. What a show. Hey, I'm just pleased to do my small part to contribute to the audience that is Shine On Nation. There we go. <laughs> you can subscribe, follow, and find the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, and on all major podcast platforms. I'm Evan Shine, and I'll talk to you again real soon.